This is Whitley Strieber. We have Lawrence Gardner with us today. We're going to be talking about what has gone wrong in Baghdad with the looting of the museums and its significance to those of us who are interested in and uh, searching through the human past for what was really happening there. Of course, Lawrence is the author of Bloodline of the Holy Grail, Realm of the Ring Lords, and now the latest Lost Secrets of the Sacred Ark. It is an extraordinary book, and we're going to be talking with Lawrence on Dreamland about Lost Secrets of the Sacred Ark, I think, in a week or two. So uh, that's going to be a very, very exciting program. Lawrence, also, I don't believe you know this. Uh, we were just talking off the air. Uh, is probably a character in a new number one bestseller, The Da Vinci Code, by Dan Brown. There is a gentleman in the book who plays a big role in the book called uh, Mr. Tebring, who is the described as the British historian royal and is the world's leading authority on the grail. Uh, unfortunately for you, Lawrence, uh, Mr. Tebring is immensely wealthy, has his own plane, and lives in a, in a vastly uh, beautiful chateau in France. I don't think your circumstances are too similar to that. <laughs> Gosh, maybe I'll change my name, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you should. Yeah. No, but it's a, it's a, I think an homage to you. I could be wrong. He, Dan Brown may never have heard of you, but uh, I, 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 if it, 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 it really is a wonderful character, a fascinating character, <laughs> and uh, it's, it's, uh, it doesn't surprise me if indeed it is you. So, okay, well let's go on and talk about Iraq. Uh, and what happened in Iraq was the. Why don't you first give your, your your impressions of what has happened there? Well, I I think what we have to acknowledge here is that, um, I mean, for, for whatever reasons, said or for against the war, that there have been wars fought in the past and wars fought now, which seemingly are presented to us as if they're supposed to sort of uphold something special about Western civilization. The unfortunate thing about those wars is that the last thing they ever consider when they're in, implemented is civilization. And um, Iraq, of course, is the you know well-known cradle of civilization. It's the birthplace of writing, medicine, astronomy, mathematics, codified law. Its history is full, full of just about everything that created civilization in the first place, going back many thousands of years. And um, so, in, in effect, um, there seems to have been a war fought which was supposedly to, to uphold something special about our type of civilization, which um, has destroyed um, a, a heritage, um, in as much as that this, you know, every nation's history is its identity, and um, it's this history which has now been looted and destroyed. Now, you speak in, uh, in gr to great length in Lost Secrets of the Sacred Ark about something that that you call uh well I can't even pronounce it Mifkut Mifkuts yeah Mifkuts and there was a name for it also in among the um among the uh uh, uh um, among the Sumerians and their and the subsequent civilizations that uh that were in what is now Iraq and this was a terribly important substance in the past, and it seems possible that in those uh, those uh, cuneiform tablets that have been destroyed and lost, and the scrolls and writing that has been destroyed, that maybe some information about this might have existed. Uh, how do you react to that possibility, or do you have any insights into it at all? I, I don't know that there's anything specifically directed towards that, Whitley. I mean, there are, there are a number of tablets and, and old documents from um, Sumerian and Akkadian and Assyrian times that relate to uh, this substance. In fact, Mufkuts was the name that the Egyptians gave it in, in uh, Mesopotamia, or old Iraq. It was, it was actually called um, Shemana, which meant highwood firestone. Um, there's mention of it in the documents. I don't know whether there's anything uh, in particular in, in the museum that, that anybody would have wanted that, that held the ultimate secret of it or anything like that, unless they found the Golden Fleece documents or something of that sort. What is uh, the so Golden I, I don't see it as a conspiracy on that front. What is the Golden Fleece document? Oh, well, the, the Golden Fleece document is, is, is in essence, the, the old Greek legend of the Golden Fleece. 
uh, which is generally portrayed to us as if it was a search for some sort of golden um, ram's wool skin or something of that sort. But but in essence, uh, the, the 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 documents say that the, the mistranslation, the, the translation is a bad one. In fact, the word fleece should have been skin. It was a sheep skin which actually contained uh, what, in essence, would have been the recipe for for manufacturing this particular substance from gold. And what is the significance of this substance? Well, the significance was that um, if we go back to um, Mesopotamian times uh, in Babylonia and, and Akkad in particular, uh, and also into ancient Egypt, the time of the Old Kingdom in particular, and at various stages through to the 12th to the 18th dynasty, um, the substance was actually fed to the kings and to the pharaohs in these regions, and it was said to give them extraordinary powers of awareness and perception and longevity, that sort of thing. Um, modern science has, has now rediscovered the substance in actual fact, which can be made from platinum group metals and gold. It's a, a monatomic white powder substance, which is described as an exotic element by science today, and it does seem to have these uh, these particular powers because it, it operates by um, activating and heightening the the um, secretions throughout the um, hormonal system in the body, the endocrinal system. So um, it certainly does seem to have powers to do exactly what the old document said it did. Now, I've been since I've been reading Lost Secrets of the Sacred Ark, I've been doing a lot of research on the Internet trying to find if there's anybody who sells this substance, and I have to tell you that I've been very dubious about the claims I've read. Mm. Um, uh, is there any... It, 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 how is this actually made? Well, it, it, it can... It can there, there are two ways of, of getting it in actual fact. Um, one, it can be found as a natural substance on Earth, and in fact, um, the Un Washington University in St. Louis and, and NASA are now claiming that, that tons of this stuff are dumped onto the Earth each year from, from outer space. It's, it's actually, it seems to be uh, a silica-based substance um, from a metal-rich supernova explosion sometime in the long, long distant past, and... Um, it's sort of trickling down on us all the time. So there are certain sites on Earth where it seems to appear in great abundance, which was actually how it was first discovered here back in 1996 in uh, near Phoenix, Arizona. Um, so there's the natural form of the substance. It's found in deep sea beds, sediments, uh, Gulf of Mexico, places like that, places where there have been asteroid hits in, in the past. It's, it's, it's actually a, a form of, of metal, which isn't metal anymore. If you, if you really uh, attack metal w with, with, with the sharpest of electrical chemical assaults and, and sort of frighten the life out of it, it forgets that it's metal and falls apart into single atoms, and this is the stuff that, that has the magical qualities. So you can actually make it from the metal, uh, which is an expensive way of doing it, or you can pick it up from trace elements in, in certain places. And there are, as you say, many sites on the Internet that are advertising varieties of this substance, and I'm currently in the process of getting to know some of these companies and, and really evaluating some of the products which they're selling just to try and find out uh, quite what they are, because some of them will be re very rich in the um, substance which they claim to be and others won't be they'll, they'll yes. contain a lot of other trace elements so uh, th therein is the problem so you know if you're offered something which pretends to be platinum or gold and is very very cheap at $40 a bottle you know you're not getting the real thing you know uh, what's so interesting about this to me is that uh, I have been trying ever since I picked up Lost Secrets of the Sacred Ark to remember uh, something uh about Otto Skorzeny, the the Hitler's famous commando, who went to Rien le Chateau in southern France, the site of so much speculation, uh, the little church there, of course, mm -hmm. uh, regarding the Grail, right toward the end of the war, and sent Hitler back a message, I've got it. And I've wondered whether or not what the... the uh, priest there who became so suddenly wealthy in uh, the late 19th century might have had might not have been this substance because of course leaders knowing its power might very much want to take it and keep it secret from their subjects yeah I mean H Hitler was quite fanatical about certain objects which are revered in history as being the, 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 the hallows of, of the grail or the, the hallows of grail castle and they included the uh, the, the chalice of the Grail itself included um, 
the Spear of Destiny. And, um, in fact, he formed the SS, really, simply to, to quest for these items. This sort of alchemical secret service department was really formed to quest for these grail things. Mostly what he was interested in was the spear. You know, that there are a lot of legends associated with the spear, and um, uh, in the hands of, of certain people like Charlemagne, for example, you know, whenever it was carried into battle by the leader or emperor, they, they never lost the battle. So it had a, a lot of superstition attached to it. And um, when they lost it or dropped it, bad things happened. So it, it was a superstition-based item. And Hitler actually got hold of this spear, which is now in a museum in, in Vienna. Um, the interesting thing is that he held it for a number of years. And, and when, he, when it was finally taken from him, um, General Patton led the 7th Army into Nuremberg Castle and um, snatched it back. And it was really on the day after that, the very day after that, that Hitler shot himself. So the superstition must have been quite enormous. With regard to the powder, I've, I've got no idea. Um, you know, there, there's nothing that I've ever seen in reference to Renner Chateau which is associated with the powder as such. However, um, Templar documents do stipulate that there were documentary secrets there, so it's very possible that, that some of the documentary secrets could have been about that. Um, there's no record of them ever getting into Hitler's hands as such. What, what Berenger Sonia was, was mostly interested in, in fact, he, he was paid a lot of money for the return of them to the Vatican, uh, which he found at Rennes Chateau, were genealogical documents, and um, you know, documents relating to the family of Jesus and, and that sort of thing. All through the early centuries, every Roman emperor had issued a dictate to the generals in the field to hunt down and persecute and put to the sword the heirs of Jesus. And this was a, a, a genealogical, a set of genealogical documents which related to that family and its descent. And he was paid a lot of money for for it. And um, I think, probably with good motive, really, he just got rid of the papers and got money and built schools and hospitals in the area. So he was quite a benefactor. But his partner, another priest, decided that he didn't want to be part of it. So he was promptly murdered by the papal police. Uh, yeah, the papal police in those days had a. They they could be pretty pretty darn dangerous. Uh, oh yeah. You now the papacy in its in its own um, in, the, in the papal states at that time was still a very very brutal regime and had been for a long long time mm. uh, almost really a police state. Uh, so that's not surprising. Fortunately, mm. the papacy of today is in no way similar. I hope. Uh, the let's uh, talk a little bit about the. Looting in Baghdad, because uh, I am more concerned about it, I think, than you are, in the sense that I've gotten uh, information from people who were actually on the scene uh, that we've published on our website. It's not a secret uh, yeah. uh, that the, the U.S. troops, that the the the, the uh, one of the directors of the museum was out there actually begging. U.S. troops to stop the looting, and they would not do it. They were right there on the scene of the Baghdad National Museum, and uh, uh, the destruction in the uh, Museum of uh, uh, the of Texts is a different story. That that museum wasn't wasn't guarded at all. But what's bothersome about all of this is scholars all over the world had been bombarding the Bush administration with pleased to safeguard these museums mm. uh, from early March, yeah. from before the war even started. Absolutely. And why I mean, didn't they? Do we I, have, I, I, mean, I just can't <laughs> see this without seeing a conspiracy. Yeah, it's quite a question, isn't it? I mean, Nabil Amin, the deputy director of the museum, um, said that he pleaded with the American troops just to have at least one tank and even a couple of soldiers there to prevent it, but nothing happens uh, and when we look back at the records we see that you know both inside and outside Iraq before the war began there was a lot of concern um, about damage to the museum I mean in, in essence America uh, wasn't too clever about it because the destruction of cultural and religious documents in war is explicitly prohibited by the Hague Convention of 1954 but America decided not to ratify that because it was worried about the fact that it might inhibit their air bombing, so it didn't see it as part of the same thing. So clearly, um, cultural artifacts weren't weren't part of the the big scheme. But prior to the war, I mean, we had the um, the American Association for Research in Baghdad, the 
Archaeological Institute of America, World Monuments Fund. You know, all of these people warned the State Department there about the risk to archaeological sites, but nothing really seems to have been done about it. I mean, even even over here, we we have um, a similar situation. Uh, we we've got the Ashmolean Museum at Oxford University, and Eleanor Robson of of the museum. Um, had written from the British School of Archaeology in, in Iraq, and she'd written repeatedly to the British government before the war, expressing, expressing concern um, over this matter. But there, there was just no answer at all. And now uh, the government are making the point that they couldn't have foreseen that this would happen. But, you know, I mean, the fact is that war is chaos, isn't it? War means the, looting. It happens yeah. all the time. But they must so have it foreseen seems it. to me that, that the very fact that they did nothing about it um, does, as you say, look rather as if um, there was a reason for them doing nothing about it. Well, that's what bothers me because mm. I was, uh, you know, I was not against this war. I have uh, gone on record on my website as saying that I thought that there were good reasons to do this uh, that were nothing to do with with uh, the alleged presence of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, mm. which I had my doubts about. Uh, yeah. It had more to do with the the simple fact that it would take $200 worth of gelignite or plastique to stop the flow of oil from Saudi Arabia for up to two years by blowing up just a couple of pumping stations. And it's a known fact. Uh, what's worrisome about that is if that happened and Iraq was, not, was the way it is now, the world price of oil would exceed $150 a barrel within a week and would remain like that. In other mm. words, it would be the end of the world economy as we know Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And the starvation of the third world would be appalling. And I thought that was an over, overwhelming reason to stabilize Iraq. But I didn't see that there would be what has happened because it's not, they say that they couldn't have anticipated it, but of course they could have and they should have because oh, yeah. they were being warned. Yeah. And, and what's so disturbing, Lawrence, is that now it's being said that it was done by organized art looters from out of the country. Mm. And it's almost as if the United States, on some level, knew this and let it happen. It's yeah. It's just terrifying. Yeah. I mean, it, with regard to the oil, it, you know, it, it wasn't necessarily unexpected to, to me, the fact that this was of primary importance in the war. In, in Lost Secrets of the Sacred Ark, I've talked about this at at some length, and that was written a, a year before the, the war commenced, but, um, you know, thinking about the, the, the new sciences of, of monatomic fuel cells and that sort of thing, which I've discussed in the book based on these exotic substances, you know, frequency moving anti-gravitational fuel cells and that sort of thing. Now, when these things are brought into the market as, as the new uh, type of fuel for transportation and, and general um, household type purposes even it will see the end of the oil industry no doubt of that which in fact seems to only have about 30 years worth of product to go anyway so it, it doesn't seem unlikely to me that, that, that there would perhaps be um, some uh, some political logic in the West determining that it should control the fall of oil within the world and therefore begin to control uh, the output of oil as it is now so that's not a big surprise but as you say you know this other thing is quite extraordinary I mean we, we've got Donald Rumsfeld the US Defense Secretary making the totally ludicrous comment um, you know about freeing Iraq and he says free people are free to make mistake, mistakes and commit crimes and do bad things just as they're free to live their lives and do wonderful things well that's a non-statement it makes absolutely no sense at all no um, in terms of the looting, you know, I mean, we're now seeing signs, there are lists in the paper today of quite a number of items which people are bringing back to the museum. Uh, they're carting them there in bags and on carts again and bringing them back, and they're saying, well, we took them to save them being destroyed and stolen by the looters, so who knows what that's all about. But, but what struck me was <clears throat> not just the looting, but the enormity of the, the destruction in general, you know, lots of things just destroyed and left around. And it just occurred to me that if... You know, if if one, for example, was to to perpetrate an, an assassination, and, and one wanted to veil that assassination, there's no, no better way to do it than to bring down a whole aeroplane load of people, or to commit a, a series of of murders to sort of cover up the one that was important. So it might just well be 
And I don't know whether this is just a conspiracy theory or whatever, but it, it might just well be that there were certain things within here which were desperately wanted by somebody yes. or some organization. And, and to actually move them out of the way and veil the fact that they were being moved to surround it with a whole lot of general chaos and, and general losing. Well, of course, the, there's also another thing. The fundamentalist uh, Arabs, the fundamentalist Muslims, have a, an agenda of wanting to destroy all images that are images of, that, are, that re- reflect the human body, human mm. face. The Christian fundamentalists have another agenda, and that is to destroy anything that suggests that mankind is more than, I believe, 2,500 years old. Yeah, yeah. And so between those two groups, one in, in the United States military and the other on the streets, there was a double motive to destroy virtually all of the texts, which would have been the objection of the Christian fundamentalists, and all of the images, which would have been the objection of the... Islamic fundamentalists. So it could have been, in part, the will- unwillingness of the U.S. military stemmed from that. Uh, although a-, a lot of people in the upper parts of the of the uh, of the Pentagon are, are answering to a Masonic group, uh, to, uh, whose whose uh, inner uh, deity is the female version of Yahweh, Shekinah. That's why they called their attack on Iraq shock and awe. Yes. Um, uh, the, the, so there's all kinds of layering of conspiracy within conspiracy here, but the bottom line is it's not so much the treasures in the museum. Uh, uh, I think that many of those will be recovered. Mm. The thing that's worrisome and that will be totally ignored is the vast number of un translated cuneiform tablets that apparently we will not see again. Yes, I mean, these are the things that actually contain um, history. They're they're absolute history. And um, And, and maybe the history of white powder gold. Yeah, you know, I wrote about this back in the time of Genesis of the Grail Kings in in 1999. Yes. It's a very odd thing, but from the middle 1800s when archaeology first really began as a profession and um, all of this wonderful stuff started to be unearthed from beneath the desert sands and and whatever it, it, it didn't take very long at all before certainly um, Christian society at its highest level its funding level in fact for the expeditions came down very heavily on archaeologists and issued instructions I mean even uh, Flinders Petrie Britain's foremost archaeologist in, in the late 1800s and early 1900s was actually struck off um, the, um, the, the the list for funding from the Egypt Exploration Fund because he would actually broken the binding rule of the association and, and the, the articles and memorandum of the uh, Egypt Fund at that time actually stated that they, they would fund uh, expeditions and digs uh, to produce discoveries that upheld um, the standard um, Old Testament teachings, where, whereas in fact what was happening was that Petri and others at that time were starting to bring back all sorts of amazing things which didn't uphold them at all. They were completely in, in contrast to what we, was being taught. Now, when I, I started to look at this, I, I found that actually there was a big difference between what was being taught and what was actually in some of the early scriptures and documents anyway. So we've been misled by teaching, if, if not by documents like the Bible. But you know, quite suddenly from that time, the Bible was not the only document of, of ancient record, if, if one can call it that at all. Um, uh, all of these other things were coming to light, and, and there's no doubt at all that, that you know the Christian church... Um, has decided long, long ago in the 1700s that that Adam existed in 4004 BC. The, the Jewish um, fraternity gave him a date of 3,600 and something. Right. Um, so you know anything that happens before that is rather upsetting for for this sort of cultural teaching. The moment we've got civilization and and, uh, and uh, municipal culture, writing, mathematics, all of this sort of stuff going back into very ancient times you know these documents contain records of even fashion houses in, in 3000 BC yes this sort of thing. I know it. so it, it's quite you know it, it's it, it's logical to presume that there would be a lot of people out there who pre- really much prefer these things not to exist 
the, the, the difficulty that I have in, in, in understanding the logic is that, that actually there's nothing much there that's in museums, whether it be in Baghdad or whether it's been moved to the Louvre or to uh, the British Museum or the uh, Oriental Institute in Chicago or wherever, that hasn't now been photographed and translated anyway. So, you know, even if one loses the great heritage of the original document, what the document said still exists. So the, these people, if they're, if they're hiding it away for that reason, can't lose that. You know, the, the information is certainly there, and, and, and we know that these great civilizations existed. I mean, we know that um, up in, uh, in Syria, I mean, the great town of Jericho with its bathrooms yes. and, and water supplies and everything was, was, was there at 9000 B.C. I mean, this is not a surprise to anybody now, and I think most people have forgotten the 4000 B.C. date of Adam, but... This is beginning to bring it all back to the fore again. Yes, but here in the United States, there are plenty of people who would like to enforce that date mm. as a matter oh, yeah. of belief and law. Yeah. So yeah. many people, and many people within the military, undoubtedly, I'm not saying that the military is particularly involved with Christian fundamentalism or not, or with radical fundamentalism, my point is only this. There are radical Christian fundamentalists here with as much of a motive as the radical Muslim fundamentalists to destroy this material. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, America is, is, is a little strange to, to, to us in Britain in as much as that what's taught over there in these contexts does seem to vary from state to state. You know, you've got some states which are evolutionary and others which uh, adhere to the scriptures and some that teach both and some that don't really want to teach either. There doesn't seem to be any sort of national um, conformity there at all. And, and so, you know, it, it's really quite a dreadful shame for, for those people who don't at least get the choice to, to hear both sides of the story. But we go through these periods of madness every once in a while. You do. Yes, but, I mean, over do. there, to, to be really honest, I mean, if you, if you take places like Yale University, the museum there, if you take places like the Oriental Institute of Chicago, I mean, just in those two alone, apart from anything else, you've got some of the greatest collections of this ancient stuff in, the world. in America. And I, I mean, I always hated the concept that, that everything was removed from these ancient places and, and, and swept across to the West to end up in America and Britain and Germany and France. But now, I mean, right now today, I, I'm pretty glad that did happen because yes. many of them are secure. Well, that's true. Lawrence, I would like to thank you very much for this conversation. I believe it's the week of May the 10th that Lawrence will be on Dreamland with us discussing in detail Lost Secrets of the Sacred Ark, the amazing revelations of the incredible power of gold, and that is going to be an extraordinary program. Lost Secrets of the Sacred Ark has been incredibly popular. It has sold out all over the world, and the publisher is presently frantically reprinting. You can pre-order Lost Secrets of the Sacred Ark on unknowncountry.com, and uh, uh, as a pre-ordering customer, obviously, you'll be among the first in line when our copies do come in toward the end of April, uh, early May. Lawrence, I would like to thank you again for being with us. It is not Sir Lawrence Gardner, is it? Uh, 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 someone told me, I believe Jim Mars, that he thought that you were Sir Lawrence Gardner, and I didn't think that. That's it. correct, yes. It, it is. I, I mean, I don't use it a lot, but, um, but uh, yes, it is. Oh, oh, all right. Well, I'll remember that in the future. And, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't worry, Willie. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank anyway, I really look forward to the 10th of May. That'll be great. Yes. We'll be talking to you then. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.